So good afternoon, everyone uh, who have joined us for uh, today's session on uh, various alternatives available in managing COVID-19. Today, uh, we have eminent speaker, uh, Dr. Sayam Bhattacharya uh, from uh, uh, Indian Institute of uh, Health and Hygiene. Uh, for public health from Kolkata, we'll be discussing on the diagnosis aspects. Uh, we'll be uh, getting a brief download about what happened so far in managing COVID, uh, you know, since 2020 end and now, what all the medicines that we have been uh, using. Uh, a little bit uh, brief about uh, the new variant Omicron and uh, accordingly. Sir, over to you. Uh, sir, you are not audible. Sorry, sorry. Good afternoon to all. I uh, hope I'm audible now. Is it clearly coming yes. now? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Now, good afternoon from All India Institute of Hygiene and Public Health, Kolkata. I'm Dr. Shayan Bhattacharya, Associate Professor of Microbiology. And today's topic is uh, the newer aspects in diagnosis and management of uh, COVID-19. So the COVID-19 pandemic is running here since almost two years now, uh, one year, nine months. And uh, it is uh, uh, currently many waves are there and uh, many uh, variants are coming up, many mutants are coming up, and probably they are opening up new avenues of diagnosis and uh, therapy. So uh, taking more time, I'll share the screen. Is it visible now? Hello? Uh, not yet, doctor. Uh, Parvati, is it visible? No, it's not visible. Okay. Okay, okay. Let's uh, let's try me for let's try from the laptop. Sure, sir. Is it visible now? Uh, yes, doctor. Okay, I'm starting the slideshow. Okay? Yeah, sure, sure, perfect. So the today's topic is newer alternatives for diagnosis and treatment of COVID-19. So I again thank MedPiper for giving this opportunity to interact with you people. So uh, introducing the topic you all know better than me, COVID-19 is caused by the SARS coronavirus 2. And uh, the SARS coronavirus 1 caused the sudden acute respiratory syndrome that was seen in December 2002 in China and other Southeastern Asian countries. And this pandemic is running since March 2020, SARS coronavirus 2 pandemic causing COVID-19. 
and by now several mutants and variants have emerged that may defy diagnosis and treatment so diagnosis rests upon detecting the spike protein probably there are some mutants or mutation in the spike protein or something that uh, does not allow proper diagnosis and treatment by now several vocs or variant of concerns have emerged like alpha beta delta delta plus mu and very recently omicron variant has uh, emerged and uh, Uh, one month back also or 15 days back also the uh, the most common uh, way of voc that was there everywhere was delta or delta plus uh, but now omicron is emerging and probably uh, uh, just a matter of a uh, few weeks maybe it may be the dominant uh, variant of concern everywhere that is detected it was first detected recently from botswana and republic of south africa in african continent and it has Uh, 12 mutations and by now we know that it may have up to 30 mutations only in the spike protein uh, so omicron variant might have uh, arisen due to reassortment with other coronaviruses like your uh, dear coronavirus so re- reassortment or recombination between the human coronavirus or sars coronavirus and the animal coronaviruses may lead to some more variations or some more mutations that may arise and some genetic reassortment might also occur that might uh, pose or cause some changes in the virus that may make it difficult to be detected or make it uh, difficult to elicit immune response so the delta plus and omicron have mutations in the spike protein that make uh, rt pcr detection a bit difficult and vaccines may also not work against these because vaccine the uh, memory cell or the immune system also recognizes mainly the spike protein which is the outermost protein expressed on the these uh, sun ray like spikes of the sars coronavirus and features like anosmia and loss of taste may be late to appear or may not appear in case of variants like delta and omicron in fact the most common uh, symptoms or uh, uh, of omicron are the extreme tiredness muscle pain and uh, there may be no hypoxia or very little hypoxia all of spo2 may be minimal now this picture shows that uh, omicron is indeed a growing concern although the cases may be all mild but still it is uh, more infectious than the delta or delta plus britain has confirmed two more cases two days back linked to the omicron the newly identified variant and uh, by now the south africa has reported at least 100 South Africa is not the place where the Omicron variant have originated. Maybe it is the place where it has been first detected. Botswana has reported two, Hong Kong two, UK, Belgium, Israel, Denmark, and by the time of this presentation, India has also uh, recorded about twenty-one cases uh, till yesterday. So it is now spreading uh, like wildfire, and uh, Omicron may be the dominant species in a matter of few days. What are the symptoms of Omicron? Uh, the extreme tiredness and muscle pain are the most common symptoms and these symptoms are found in very young people also so it is not that only the old people or the comorbid people will have some symptoms the fall in oxygen saturation is very rare and it may be very late like other coronaviruses or it may not appear a uh, little bit of uh, throat itch or throat dryness or scratchy throat is uh, seen in omicron that is uh, not commonly found with other variants and 50% of the omicron uh, cases are vaccinated individuals so it vaccine may not protect adequately against this infection and uh, this omicron is uh, has a proper name on 26 november who designated the variant b1.1.529 as omicron on the advice of the ta tagv group this decision was based on the evidence that omicron has several mutations which have an impact on how it behaves now uh, we all know the basic clinical features so what are the samples we should go for for a diagnosis of covid 19 nasopharyngeal swab as we all know is the best throat swab is uh, the worst and uh, among the all samples so nasopharyngeal swab can be taken nasopharyngeal aspirate can be taken throat swab is worse even blood sample can be taken mixing the samples is better so if you uh, take both the nasopharyngeal and the throat swab in one swab stick or in two different swab sticks and mix them together you can get a more uh, sensitive result or a more high yield of the virus what are the new options in diagnosis 
the newer options in diagnosis are the uh, point of care tests or rt pcr or lamp all are point of care uh, tests now which give a rapid results maybe within 5 minutes 10 minutes 15 minutes cbnat cartridge based nucleic acid amplification amplification test will give results in a few hours rapid antigen test are very cheap and affordable can be done at home uh, by the person himself but uh, it can lack sensitivity although it is a specific and many brands and many uh, companies are available over the market there is a new option that is coming up all are all these are basically nucleic acid amplification test which detects the viral uh, genetic material or the rna or it depends on the nucleic acid amplification like the true nat can detect covid 19 in 2 hours it is like a, a small cartridge and the, the whole apparatus is very portable and does not need ac or sophisticated equipment can be operated by a battery and needs no particular temperature monitoring also and the contamination is less so true nat uh, is uh, advised now by the government of india also icmr also and uh, it has been uh, manufactured by the mol bio company in goa so it can also detect other diseases so true nat has also come up for covid 19 so point of care test what are point of care test that give results in a very short time and they are convenient to use they are not very costly and they point of care test has been authorized to use with certain specimen types only it varies from specimen to specimen like you cannot replace the nasopharyngeal swab specimen with a serum or a urine specimen and should these should only be used with those specimen types that are advised and proper specimen collection and handling are critical for all covid-19 testing so it may be false negative if you do not collect the specimen or the sample adequately or correctly uh, hope i am audible and visible hello yes sir yes sir okay okay so the what is the problem in rt pcr for detecting omicron there are some problems that uh, techn technologist or doctor might encounter one is that it identifies only uh, one identifier normally two identifiers are found uh, now we use three identifiers that is the rdp or the rna polymerase region the nucleocapsid region and also the spike region but the spike region the probes or primers that we are using may not detect omicron because the it has got a, a lot of mutations in the spike protein so the spike signal is not detected in the conventional rt pcr that we are using in fact it's uh, the absence of the spike signal and presence of the two other eye signals may be a clue that it may be omicron but the proper sure shot diagnosis has to be obtained by the uh, sequencing the viral genome sequencing which is not available in most of the laboratories only in west bengal only two labs and a country also uh, very few labs are doing actively the uh, virus sequencing but it should be done it is uh, this way it is similar to alpha variant because alpha variant does not also produce a spike signal and the delta variant produces a weak spike signal however alpha the the percentage has gone down drastically in india in india you very rarely find alpha variant so if you find uh, absence of spike signal or presence of the two other identifiers it is more likely to be omicron now and the omicron variant has 30 different mutations that have not been seen before all, almost all of these mutations are in the spike protein a large number of them are on the spike protein of the viruses the spike protein is the ray like projection on the surface of the nucleocapsid outer surface which attaches the virus to the ac2 receptor of the host which then internalizes the virus the spike protein is in fact the target of most of the vaccines and that is the most uh, most highly concerning thing that is if there are mutations so many mutations in the spike protein the vaccines that have already been given may not provide adequate protection as such the vaccines are also not very protective after 7 8 months or 9 months and so the yearly booster is being considered by the government of india and the icmr and is being uh, given in other countries like the uk and usa and the european countries have already started the booster vaccinations campaigns and in standard tests omicron has what is known as a s gene dropout so the spike gene can may not be detected it is uh, it is a uh, not found but in delta it may be found mostly it is found and that gives a clue that it could be the omicron variant but let not for let's not forget delta it is still now the uh, predominant 
variant or strain of the virus. This picture highlights how the Omicron virus is, uh, variant is detected. I'll zoom it a bit. And uh, the PCR test is conducted on the nasopharyngeal aspirate sample. It looks for the, primarily we look for the three genes, spike, nucleocapsid, and the envelope or outer shell E. So is, if the S gene is detected, then it is unlikely to be Omicron. And if the S gene is not detected, it can very well be Omicron. So final, uh, the confirmation is done by the full gene analysis used by the sequencing that we do by sequencing in other tests. And, uh, and so by this way, we can uh, detect the Omicron uh, variant. The express, there is a gene expert, express SARS-CoV-2 by Cepheid company. Uh, and the expert express SARS-CoV-2 flu RSV and the expert express O2 flu RSV plus. They can also detect the Omicron variant by virtue of this principle that is the S gene dropout. The S gene is not detected, but the other two targets are detected. So this can also be done. Basically, it is the same test of the uh, genetic amplification tests, PCR test, although and the results can be quicker. So now scientists have successfully developed a rapid point of care test for the detection of SARS coronavirus 2 neutralizing antibodies. It is a simple test only requiring a drop of blood from a finger trip can be performed within 10 minutes without the need for a laboratory or specific trained personnel. So you put a drop of intrapic blood uh, from the particular the paper that is provided and it can detect the antibodies against the SARS coronavirus 2. But uh, uh, this may not indicate the active, indica active infection or the recent infection. So, this is a drawback. Uh, but in fact, it may be important for zero surveillance or the extent of the herd immunity or exposure that is to be estimated. And this test is called the SMART test. Why? The Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology SMART test. This was led by the antimicrobial resistance interdisciplinary research group at uh, SMRT or Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology. So basically, the, what are the targets? The gene may be the target, the antibody may be the target, and for rapid test, the antigen also may be the target. And if we want to detect antibody, we will need blood or serum. And if you want to detect antigen or the gene products, we need the nasopharyngeal aspirate. Now, the rapid test that are card tests that we are doing, the self kit tests are basically lateral flow tests. Uh, lateral flow tests can be either diagnostic or they can either detect the infection or they can also sometimes detect the sequence. They are good for COVID 19, but they cannot indicate variants or mutants. They lack sensitivity, but they are very specific. They are likely to be positive in Omicron also because it is the, the antibodies that are embedded also detect the antigens that are present in Omicron. And they're also rapid and give result in 14 minutes and they're easy to operate and handle. So rapid tests or ICT tests are one examples of the rapid uh, lateral flow tests. There can be other lateral flow tests. All rapid diagnostic tests are basically lateral flow tests because the antigen flows through the nitrocellulose membrane and reacts with the antibody that is already embedded. And uh, within 15 minutes, uh, there are two spots that are appearing or two lines that are appearing which give a positive result interpretation. But if only the control line is appearing, it is a negative result. The control line should appear. It should not be such that the test is appearing and the control is not appearing. The test is T, and the control is C. If that happens, that is the control line is not there, test line is there, the test is invalid. The control lines contains antibody against human IgG. So human IgG is always present in a sample. So antibodies against IgG are there already in the control line. And if the plasma or the serum crosses that line, there will be a band. The WHO recommends the rapid diagnostic test for SARS-CoV-2 might uh, must possess a minimum sensitivity of 70% and at least 97% specificity. And more or less, this is the sensitivity and specificity that most of the tests uh, claim to have although they are, uh, the sensitivity is not very high. Because, but because they have high specificity, some countries have, uh, like Slovakia and the United Kingdom, are using these lateral protests or ICT as a way of screening the whole of the population. So it can be used for screening. Whenever you have some features like dry cough or, uh, or the tiredness or fever or uh, breathlessness, you can go for this test and you can do it yourself. 
So example, Covisel for myself, uh, this test is there, available in the medical stores all over the country. There may be about Binox now. Their tests are like our tests, like the pregnancy card test. The swabs are provided, the lysis buffer is provided. We have to take swabs from both the nostrils and put it in the lysis buffer, break the swabs, and then shake uh, the material inside the lysis buffer for a few minutes, and then put two drops of the lysis buffer on the well, and then wait for the results. But nowadays, electrochemical sensors have also been used. They have, can also be very highly sensitive. So these are just have to dip in the same liquid sample and some sensors will appear. So regarding point of care test, the lamp test or nucleic uh, acid amplification or the light, or uh, this is an isothermal test, RT lamp. This is an urgent need for a better technique for COVID-19 testing. The superior technique is now in India in the form of RT lamp loop mediated isothermal amplification, but with the help of a reverse transcriptase. So basically, first the reverse transcriptase is there, which converts the RNA into cDNA or copy DNA. And then the DNA is amplified isothermally by the lamp technique. Uh, the advantage is that it is isothermal at 65 degrees Celsius, hence advantage of RT-PCR, because RT-PCR you have to move it at different temperatures. First uh, 95, then 54, then 72. Uh, denaturation, annealing, and extension. So uh, this uh, this is overcome by the help of lamp test, which occurs at a particular temperature only. So don't have to worry about the temperature monitor. Genome sequencing is there, which can detect mutants and variants, but is not routinely available everywhere. And West Bengal only IICB, Kolkata Indian Institute of Chemical Biology, and the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, Kalyan, uh, is also near Kolkata. They are doing it. So uh, routinely, uh, people have to send samples for confirming the sequence. And this helps in the uh, diagnosis of Delta, Delta plus mu or uh, this uh, Omicron, whatever is there, it confirms. So one more point of care sequencing test is there, which uh, is called the Feluda test. Now, for those who are Bengali out here, the audience, Feluda is a character that one instantly identifies. He is a famous fictional detective character created by... Satyajit Roy, Satyajit Ray, who was the famous director and he was a very accomplished author also. So this Feluda has a full form. It was, it was discovered by the Tata group and uh, the full form is FN CAS 9 Editor Limited Uniform Detection Assay. And this is uh, this in, uh, launched by the DCGI and it is, it is uh, now endorsed by the DCGI. What is Feluda? It is the first CRISPR CAS9. CRISPR is the cluster regularly interspaced short palindromic repeat. So in the genetic sequence here, there is A, T, T, A, G, C, C, G. So these are palindromic repeats. So they are regularly interspaced in a SARS coronavirus in a particular variant. And if that pattern is detected, so it helps in the confirmation of diagnosis of say Omicron, Mu, Alpha, whatever is there. So in the targets, we have gene, we have antigen, we have antibody, and we also have the sequences or the cluster regularly interspersed, short palindromic repeat sequences. And this is also rapid. Within a few minutes, you will get the results, 15 to 20 minutes. With this new qPCR independent, this is independent of the quantitative PCR point of care diagnostic approach, the genomic sequence of SARS coronavirus 2 can be detected by the lateral flow assay. Hybrid detect. So this is also uh, combining the lateral flow test. So their sequencing is done, and then the hybridization process process detects the uh, particular virus variant. So uh, this is called the Peluda test. What are the advantages of the Peluda test compared to qPCR? Affordable. It is very cheap, and the time is less. Limited resources are required. No equipment, heavy equipment is needed. Only one instrument is needed. It's easy to use in the lateral flow based reading. The interpretation is also easy. So anybody can interpret. No particular expertise is needed. Another test is the Sherlock. Sherlock is the specific high sensitivity enzymatic. It's a reporter unlocking, which is the developed in the US. So the enzymatic reporters or the, the, uh, the genes are there that are unlocked or detected in the particular. Uh, this CAS12 is used for the detection of SARS coronavirus to this gene. So 
uh, another technique or isothermal technique is the Abbott ID, which is basically lamp test, RT lamp. So these are the few different tests. So if you uh, zoom on this table, molecular tests are there, which detects the viral RNA, like the PCR samples are there, nasopharyngeal swab, saliva, throat swab is the worst sample, takes present of the uh, serum, and the time of assay is less than two hours in case of this uh, RT lamp or other things. And there are some molecular point of care tests also, but the time to result may be hours to days. And uh, even real time PCR takes not more than two, three hours, but the time to result will be hours to days. Even CB9 is a molecular test. Now, if you go for this antigen detection test, NNS proteins that are detected, these antigens are detected. These are the uh, lateral flow or ICT test or OV self tests, 15 to 30 minutes. And the nasopharyngeal swab is taken, but the problem is it's not as sensitive. And there's a high false negative result. But it is easy to implement and easy to interpret. Antibody tests are like the, this uh, on paper based finger prick test, which detects the antibody produced by the body. And uh, again, it is a rapid test, a rapid test and IgM and IgG. But the problem is that IgM and IgG antibody may take one to three weeks to develop. IgG antibody may not be detected very early. And the presence of antibody cannot be treated with an individual immun immunity. The presence of the person may be immunized. Uh, but he was, may not be infected, still he will have IgM and IgG antibody. So it is not that, uh, not that uh, uh, accurate, but it can indicate the presence in the community of the serosurveillance purpose it can serve. Some tests may exhibit grossly activity to other coronaviruses. Some limitations for these rapid POCTs, studies have revealed significant concerns surrounding the supportive information reported by manufacturers. So they may hide some information. And uh, even in the myself or COVID self test, there is an app uh, that you should download, but nobody downloads it. You should upload the data to the government if you have a positive result and you have to confirm by RT PCR. But that uh, may that part may be missing, and anybody can do this test. Information transparency is poor and the human factor issues are not properly addressed. So they may be misused and there may not be adequate monitoring. Still, it is advantageous in terms of its ease of use, greater approachability on the user's end, more timely detection and comparable accuracy and sensitivity. Sensitivity is not that high, but the specificity is almost as good as the molecular test. So this point of care testing is there. This is the coronavirus picture. Instantly, one can identify SARS coronavirus 2. So, uh, first we uh, uh, collect the sample and go for nucleic acid amplification method conventionally. And in the ICT test, we just drop uh, the lysis buffer containing the broken swab. And within a few minutes, these lines will appear. And we can do CLIE or lateral flow ICT or other tests. And biosensors, what are they? The antigen is present in the sample in the aliquot. And this antibody uh, coupled with the chromogens are there on the slide or the surface of the matrix. And put that antigen or uh, sample containing the possible antigen and immediately some sensors will uh, amplify some signals indicating the presence of this antigen. So what is the infection indicator? The labs had to focus on the taking travel history of people whose samples are being tested. This was the technical part. Now the clinical part, travel history is important. Why? Because recent travel to European countries and from the African countries is becoming very important. The mutation in Omicron has happened in the S gene. And whenever you get a S gene dropout in the RT PCR, uh, you should be suspicious. The F gene is missing in the RT PCR to be an indicator that infection is caused by Omicron. Most of the ICMR approved RT PCR test does not target the S gene. And these genes, only two genes are targeted N and ORF open reading frame and the nucleocapsid. So uh, other tests can also detect the envelope. So basically it is uh, competent enough to detect the uh, Omicron variant. So these kids will detect all infections, including that caused by Omicron, but will not detect accurately the variant. That cannot indicate that this is Omicron. Uh, for all variants, confirmation can be done only by the whole genome sequencing. So this is my the gist of my talk today. But we are not limited, science is not limited to molecular test or lab test. 
Uh, they can also use animals like dogs, sniffer dogs that particularly they can be used to detect tuberculosis and other diseases also. They are capable of being trained to identify COVID-19 cases by sniffing their odor, nuclear and azopharyngeal aspirator swab sample. By detecting the particular volatile organic compounds or VOCs, so they may be different from the volatile organic compounds uh, present in the healthy individual, so they can use as a reliable tool in limited screening. Animals are tested and rewarded, trained and rewarded after sniffing positive samples. So thereby they uh, get a reflex mechanism of detecting the positive sample smell. So whenever in a, but first they have to be trained using positive control or known positive or known negative that what is their reaction pattern. And if you get that reaction pattern, then they are rewarded and thereby they get trained by the memory of the reward that this was the uh, particular sample. So they will react in that manner only. But the sensitivity is low, not very high, 86%, but specificity is also not very low, 92.9%. Uh, In these uh, particular alicots or this particular cup-like instruments, sample is kept and the dogs take the smell. Other than this, there are animal models for COVID-19 also, because we are developing drugs, we are developing vaccines. So uh, we need some animal models for these things. Uh, mice is not a good model because their ACE2 receptor does not bind the human SARS coronavirus to that well. Uh, generally modified mice, genetically modified mice expressing that uh, human ACE2 can be used or they can uh, SARS, they can be exposed to SARS coronavirus coupled with the adenovirus that expresses the ACE2. These can be uh, tried and if we do not go for this, we can try Syrian hamster, Mesopricatus auretus, which is a better model because its AC2 receptor uh, binds the SARS coronavirus 2 and the disease pattern is uh, just like man, old, the old people and the males suffer more. <coughs> but the water now, uh, diagnostic part is more or less covered, but there are some issues still that may remain uncovered. What are the things to remember while treating COVID-19? The drugs can be either antiviral or the immunomodulator. So it's not necessary that we always kill the virus. We can uh, downregulate our immunity also. We can uh, inhibit the viral replication also, inhibit the viral enzymes. Uh, but in any form of treatment, we should monitor the pulse oximetry, the BP, the urine output. These things, three things have to be monitored. And for treating, we all know remdesivir as a, is a protease inhibitor, all the WHO or, has not, or CDC has not endorsed it at all. But still in the clinical settings, it is useful. IL-6 antagonist tocilizumab monoclonal antibody is uh, effective but is very costly. And uh, dexamethasone is only the only proven drug that can reduce uh, mortality uh, till now and is being used clinically, modulates the host immune response. And the drugs like diclosamide and famotidine have also been tried that can inhibit the viral replication, these things. And the oral drug, molnupiravir, which inhibits the viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And this is gaining importance because this is being popular and the phase three trials have shown uh, by Mark, it has published the trials that molnupiravir can reduce the hospitalization admission by 69%. So the WHO has already declared that remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, ritonavir and rupinavir combination or interferon beta 1A. They, these were the four agents that were being tried initially. The little or no individual effect in the COVID-19 treatment. Now, what is molnupiravir? Molnupiravir or MK4482 or DIDD2801, which has been developed initially to treat influenza, uh, is uh, has been repurposed to treat the COVID patients. It interferes with the replication of the SARS coronavirus 2, thereby reducing the severity of the disease. So it is a orally available drug. This is the advantage. The replication is inhibited and uh, it has to be given early in the course of the disease, especially remdesivir also has to be given early in the course <coughs> because once the disease, the ARDS sets in, it is difficult to recover the patient. Another drug, oral drug, Paxlovid is being tried. What is Paxlovid? It is an investigational SARS coronavirus to protease inhibitor antiviral therapy. So it inhibits uh, the uh, enzyme and the viral replication and proteolysis are states that it is initially required before viral replication. So the viral replication means a proteolysis that is inhibited by the Paxlovid. 
the breakdown of paxlovid by the protease enzymes of the body is inhibited with ritonavir so it has it has to be given in a combination with ritonavir so also oral drug paxlovid ef0132132 has been found to reduce the risk of hospitalization or death by 89% compared to placebo in non hospitals uh, non hospitalized high risk adults so this drug is being manufactured by pfizer so currently mark and pfizer are the two companies that have developed two oral drugs for covid-19 treatment paxlovid is a combination of pfizer's investigation of antiviral ef0107321332 and a low dose of ritonavir this is an antiretroviral medication traditionally used to treat hiv the treatment disrupts the replication of sars coronavirus 2 in the body by binding to the 3cl like protease this enzyme crucial to the virus uh, function and reproduction so this inhibits the 3cl like protease and uh, its breakdown is inhibited by the uh, ritonavir ritonavir is also a protease inhibitor which slows the breakdown of this paxlovid and enabling it to revert, remain longer in the body that at a biosignificant level now molnupiravir is 50% effective in reducing hospitalization and death you can also induce mutations and molnupiravir is muta mutagenic paxlovid is not mutagenic so molnupiravir is about 50 to 59% effective in reducing hospitalization whereas paxlovid uh, the company claims to be 89% effective in reducing hospital admissions and deaths it is not mutagenic so uh, this uh, paxlovid is the drug of concern now everybody is excited about this drug and also molnupiravir amlodipine is works very well in preventing mortality in covid uh, patients who are hypertensive so amlodipine works very well in those patients who are hypertensive the hypertension part is checked by amlodipine and thereby the severity can be altered so it is the uh, drug that is uh, being popular now so hope uh, everybody i have cover, tried to cover most of the important new developments that the, but there may be some uh, things that i may have missed out and i am ready for further discussions and questions these are the references that i have tried to follow although there are many i have put only three the bbc new indian express and the gav vaccine network what lateral protesting is done now thank you thank you to all of you this is the picture of the river ganges and uh... Uh, thank you doctor uh, doctor there is one request from a participant uh, regarding uh, the uh, slide number 3 okay can you please put the slide number 3 can you share from your side uh, one moment otherwise Uh, let me see let me see one minute is it okay. Uh, doctor, I think this is regarding. Hello. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So this is regarding the various variants of cancer. Yes, it was regarding the VOC. VOC. Yeah, VOC. Okay. The VOC is actually the variant of cancer. Now, initially, uh, when the mutants appear, now. if their behavior or their diagnosis or their sequence is entirely different from the parental strain or the existing strain then it is uh, called the variant of interest but if the cases are very high and uh, it is spreading very fast then it is it can is called a voc or the variant of concern and by now there are many vocs or variants of concern like the alpha the delta mu and recently the omicron so omicron is the latest voc or the variant of concern 
earlier it was called the uh, earlier some names were there like the uk variant brazil variant uh, mexico variant thailand variant but it's not like that now it is uh, given greek alphabetical names uh, like alpha beta delta delta plus which is uh, somewhat different from delta and then uh, mu and omicron Uh, any, doctor, any, what any is your story? inputs uh, with reference to antibody cocktail and uh, the the new variant? Okay, antibody cocktail is a very costly option. It is uh, uh, now many antibodies are there. Like bariciting, you got some particular cocktails are also marketed. Uh, these uh, their their efficacy is not fully known. Although the companies claim to that it will be very effective in reducing the mortality and hospitalization. and uh, we have to uh, this uh, uh, two things one has to estimate uh, in fact three things one is the safety second is the efficacy and third is the cost so the cost is very high in the antibody cocktails these may cost anything between uh, 50000 to 2 lakhs per dose and uh, but uh, the efficacy is still fully not established although it may be very good in the long run but we have to wait and see and uh, the safety profile is obviously this uh, these are safe drugs uh, but the only thing in our country is maybe the efficacy and the cost thank you doctor uh, there is one question from uh, uh, dr anu so who have told reinfection rate of omicron is three times more than delta variant within 19 days of first infection your thoughts Uh, infection rate hello ah uh, yes sir reinfection is the question reinfection ah uh, i'll just repeat the question once more who had told reinfection rate of omicron is three times more than the delta variant within 90 days of first infection yes, your thoughts yes, yes. yes because the within 90 days it may cause reinfection because the body may not uh, mount enough immune response but uh, till now it has uh, it, it, it is just a speculation we have omicron the first detection is just uh, maybe a week back so it is not uh, more than 10 days that the first case has been uh, reported or diagnose so uh, but its behavior is like that there are so many mutations that it may cause more frequent reinfection this is just a speculation but we have to wait and see again uh, the number of cases are also very few and all these are not reinfection cases of omicron they are first cases of omicron initial cases but we have to monitor these cases and see whether uh, this uh, is a uh, leads to more infection whatever there uh, data is may be based on the animal models that i was uh, told that i was telling you in animal models maybe it leads to more frequent reinfection but whether the same translates in the human uh, settings we have to wait and see because uh, there is a, there are still no very uh, little information and very few number of cases of omicron all over the country or all over the world also in fact south africa has reported the maximum number of cases but the whole world over the number of cases are uh, not more than 400 so it is too early to uh, give a decisive comment uh thank you doctor and uh, when we spoke about the reinfection uh, part so while comparing to uh, delta uh, the num- the amount of uh, amount is more i mean uh, now people are really scared because the infection uh, is more and uh, immune system may not uh, cope that well against the omicron but the interesting thing is that omicron is a very uh, is till now it has caused very mild number of very mild infection or maybe asymptomatic infection and till now it has not produced any death so uh, it maybe it is a sign that the virus is adapting to the human host and maybe it is losing out the pathogenicity that may be the indication okay regarding the management of covid what hospitals and clinics need to do right now because there are been uh, talks going on uh, that india would be expecting uh, a larger third wave or something like that 
we expected a pediatric covid wave quite some time back and now the uh, new variant has come up and uh, what all the pre precautions or preparations to the hospitals and clinics should be taken care of first of all the everybody should uh, adopt covid appropriate behaviors and all should wear masks whenever they are adventuring out maintain social distancing practice and wash whenever it is required or hand sanitizing and the, we must encourage everyone to take the vaccines whatever it is there both the doses in time and uh, with due time the government will introduce the boosters and the, every clinic or hospital has to be ready with the boosters or the second shots and the, all the hospital should get more beds ready for possible admission and uh, in a mathematical model it has been postulated that the third or fourth waves whenever they come they will infect more commonly the women and the children less than 15 years so these or young people less than 40 years so these groups are will be more affected uh, by the new mutants or variants maybe by the mathematical modeling and the uh, iit has come up with this uh, result so the, keeping this in mind all the pediatric beds or the uh, women ward or the, even the general public general wards they have to be kept ready with adequate spacing and adequate facilities of monitoring oxygen pp and urine this is the uh, most important thing now and but we should not panic because uh, as far as information is uh, we are now getting all the omicron cases are very mild but uh, we are also getting some news that the omicron this possible omicron patient has escaped from the airport he is not traceable this thing should not be happening all contacts should be traced and monitored this is the primary thing whenever isolation is required they should be isolated for the particular length of time but uh, we should not panic thank you okay uh, thank you doctor and uh, just one one more question that i have found there one minute yes it's uh, regarding the genome sequencing and uh, what is the future will uh, one minute okay yes is about genomes uh, genome sequencing doctor like how uh, genomes sequencing is uh, paving away the country's current uh, you know situation like uh, through genomes sequencing we were able to track what variant it is how it is getting infected can you just give a brief like how this genome sequencing work in uh, tracking uh, uh, these kind of mutants and variants so actually the government of india policies that a particular uh, percentage of the samples or say if possible most of the samples should be sent for sequencing whole genome sequencing to detect or to predict the detection of possible variants or mutants but it is not possible every time because uh, not uh, the genome sequencing facilities are not available everywhere it is available in nib pune nib gorakhpur maybe nari and in west bengal two institutes and many some other institutes in the country but uh, sending these samples to genome sequencing or uh, these other places can be a bit difficult and but the genome sequencing should be encouraged because it gives the confirmatory diagnosis of a variant a possible variant or a possible uh, mutant that is coming up and the omicron sequence also the it was uh, can be confirmed by the genome sequencing and it should accompany the rt pcr or the rt lamp or any other rapid test that is there the confirmation of diagnosis of this variant or this mutant should be done by only and only the genome sequencing and now in this lateral flow based genome sequencing or this field that i was talking about these are also there and uh, with more time we can get more good results that is may be comparable with the conventional sequencing and uh, so this sequencing must accompany Uh, the diagnostic part in order to have a, a particular molecular epidemiology pattern the known pattern that uh, gives a true picture that these many variants are there in these regions so this uh, will help in the uh, long run uh, thank you doctor i think we have taken uh, all the questions so from uh, med piper and jonamed we would like to thank you for joining us on a tuesday afternoon for a very informative session on managing covid times and what are latest you know diagnostic methods that we have right now and uh, briefing about the omicron virus the possible uh, 
symptoms uh, and all those things and i hope the webinar was pretty much useful for all the uh, medical professionals doctors and students who have joined today uh, thank you so much we, lo we look forward to meet you for another session on uh, uh, i will uh, i'll keep you posted yes yeah thank you